In undergrad, I was a member of our formal choral program at our school, the Rochester Institute of Technology in upstate New York. And I came to the choir with decent training in vocal performance arts from my high school years. When I began, I was very excited about participating in a choir at the collegiate level. But I quickly became very disappointed in the lack of structure involved, and my apathy toward the program grew, and I became confused as to what to do. One very cold night, I was walking back from choir practice to my dorm, and I saw a flyer. And the flyer was offering auditions for the Rochester Institute of Technology Gospel Ensemble. My heart leaped with joy. Having spent a large amount of time in the Baptist Church, I was incredibly familiar with 80s and 90s gospel singers like Amy Grant, Sandy Patty, and Larnell Harris, just to name a few. I wrote down the date and time for the auditions and went back to the dormitory building excited about the potential for a new music opportunity in my life. If I could make these auditions, it also would mean that I could quit the choral program also something I wanted to do. Fast forward three or four days to me making the way into the auditorium where the auditions for the ensemble were being held. I can still remember opening the double doors to make my way into the room. I was filled with full of excitement and anticipation of being with like-minded folk who valued songs that reminded us of our humanity and our connection to something bigger than ourselves. So I opened the door slowly, crept into the back of the room, and as I looked around, a wave of anxiety and fear hit me really hard. I instantly felt I had made a terrible mistake and misunderstood the sign. Not a single person in the room was white, but rather all were African American. I could feel my face flush red, and my instinct was to turn and leave the room. Having spent most of my life at that time in predominantly white spaces, I simply didn't know what to do. I was probably seconds away of turning and leaving due to my complete sense of overwhelm. And then I heard a voice call out, welcoming me to sit by her during the auditions. And so I took my seat. That simple act of kindness kept me in the room, a room which transformed my life. She's probably not watching right now, and truthfully, she already knows how I feel about her, but just on the off chance she catches this on YouTube, thank you, Aisha Pons, for making me a better person. Through her love and support, and under the tutelage of our amazing choir director, Wardero Lewis, who incidentally is still the Gospel Ensemble's director after 30, 30 <laughs> 33 years. <laughs> I spent the next four years of my undergraduate career worshiping predominantly black, in predominantly black spaces, singing black gospel music, and unlearning decades of bad education and bad social conditioning when it comes to race relations here in the United States. I was given the opportunity to learn how diverse beliefs, perspectives, and experiences make communities more powerful. And in a recent article in the Journal of Liberal Religion, author David Tarbell argues that pluralism is not just tolerating or accepting differences, but actually celebrating them. He specifically lists out all of the different affinity groups within our larger Unitarian Universalist Association, groups like the UU Christians, the UU Humanists, UU Buddhists, UU Pagans, Trans UUs, Black Lives UUs, and Diverse Religious Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministry, or DRUM, just to name a few. Tarbell proposes that pluralism enables us to move beyond the assumption that truth is singular and knowable at all by engaging instead in dialogue with individuals who hold different beliefs, we gain more comprehensive understanding of what truth really is. The interplay of diverse perspectives expands our awareness, pushing the boundaries of our knowledge and enriching our own spiritual journeys. 
Over time, I was able to demonstrate to my colleagues in the gospel ensemble that I shared an appreciation for the connection to something larger than myself, something that collectively, together, we called God. Through many shared differences with one another, and even though we had them, this commonly held belief created a bond. I spent four years learning about my own white privilege and witnessing it manifest in ways while surrounded by American black culture. That experience was uniquely formative, and as a Unitarian Universalist, I now can appreciate all of the very difficult conversations and situations I found myself in over those four years. While various groups like the Gospel Ensemble and the UU Affinity Groups I just mentioned all have to have some kind of in-group cohesion, they must also have a recognition and ultimate understanding of truth that keeps them anchored to their larger frames. The Gospel Ensemble, while based in the black church and experience, used Christianity to bind to wider audiences. And each of the UU groups I mentioned above have Unitarian Universalism as a way to collectively bind them together. Or out of many come one. We have become a faith that values challenges to our assumptions and encourages us to question the status quo. We strive to understand and embrace the idea that's that of seeing confrontation and different perspectives as adversarial. Instead, we reframe that to see these situations as opportunities for growth and involvement. Pluralism has definitely helped me to better understand the difference between appreciation and appropriation as well. For four years of undergrad, I sang every song with conviction and admiration, and often felt a deep connection to the lyrics and underlying message of liberation and freedom. But time has allowed me to look at that admiration and the connected feeling and realize that while it is authentic, it was based on my own queer perspective, my own queer ex expression of oppression, which while similar to the black experience in America, its manifestation is vastly different and the historical origins are just not the same. And I can say now that while I have the same adoration and connection to many of the lyrics and messages and the songs present in gospel music, I recognize that the origin of pain and the origin of the great joy are often expressed, that are often expressed in the lyrics and the music have nothing to do with me nor my heritage. In fact, quite the opposite, my ancestors may have contributed significantly to that pain and joy, and I may unintentionally uphold systems that continue to do the same. As a result, I am very careful about publicly performing or embracing the genre of music without something being made clear. That celebration of anything without connection and co contextualization is what I call weak pluralism. If I were to ever publicly perform gospel music again, I would really feel the need to make sure that there was the context of that music and historical accuracy of its origin were properly explained. More importantly, I would want an existing connection to the community who upholds those wonderful songs and messaging. Without context and connection, that type, a type of plura, pluralism that we kind of heard about earlier is really just an elevation of diversity, checking off boxes as we go. We want something deeper, more meaningful. More importantly, our social justice work that anchors a lot of what we do here in this community is really not very strong if we don't create those actual connections and relationships, as Reverend Leslie said. There must be a balance between appreciation and appropriation experienced by any of us who try to embrace pluralism as a lived value. Without proper contextualization, those of us not part of the in-group don't have to do the hard work of understanding the history and the harm that is often perpetuated against an in-group that brings about that same beauty and strength that we are trying to honor, 
be that food, clothing, music, language, or other attributes that we are lifting up. What I now realize is that much of the gospel music that I learned and appreciated originated from pain and angst, and the ultimate strength gained from those trials and tribulations belong to the black experience. It is something that as a white person, I must work very hard to balance when embracing my love for gospel music, which still exists today. These deep connections that we create, be it with the gospel ensemble, with one another at coffee hour, or in our larger community with our community partners, deepen the relationships and protect those of us in the out group from being simply sympathetic to what we are trying to lift up. We are going for something stronger, deeper, more of an empathy, an understanding of the other. Today at one o'clock in the children's chapel, we're offering our class radical orientation as a way to help all of us shift our hearts into a more empathetic space while doing all of the work of justice that we do and community building around here. I hope that you can join Travis and Len for that time together. It's a really good class. In my experience, it is all, as Reverend Leslie said, about the relationships. It's about the deep connections. That we, those connections are how we often expand our hearts and minds in new ways. It's a sentiment shared in the writing of Tarbell as well. This is the actual power of plurality. The power doesn't lie in some academic or theoretical definition, and it's not found in some catchy Latin statement printed on our money, meant only, by the way, for white, land wealthy male landowners who were straight. But it is, in fact, experienced in the difficulty of sitting with difference, finding commonality, and growing our hearts and minds together in collaboration, seeing one another fully and authentically. May we be the ones to bring empathy to our work in being a more perfect union here in our congregation, in our county, in our state, in our country, and hopefully in our world.